Hi, welcome to our talk. Uh, finding bugs with specification-based testing is easy. Uh, my name is David Pierce, and uh, this is work that I've done um, with a student of mine, Janice, um, at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, and basically, we developed a tool, Quick Check for Wiley. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how that tool works. I'm going to be showing a demo, and we're going to be talking about some uh, reporting on some experimental data, looking at how effective um, that tool is finding bugs. Right, so the starting point for thinking about this project is the Quick Check tool. Um, for those that don't know, Quick Check is a, an automated testing tool which has been widely used in academia and industry. Um, here's an excerpt from the original ICFP 2000 paper by Klassen and Hughes. Quick Check is a tool which aids the Haskell programmer in formulating and testing properties of programs. Properties are described as Haskell functions and can be automatically tested on random input, but it's also possible to define custom test data generators. Um, so really the key thing here is that for a given Haskell program, um, we want to test uh, you know, the program to look for problems, mistakes, um, but the properties that we're interested in are typically implicit in the program. Um, so we need to somehow get them out. And so really what the first, the first thing that a test engineer would do would be to define a bunch of um, properties, essentially as Haskell functions in this case, and then we can then test that those properties are actually true of our program. Um, so those properties are serving as a test oracle. Um, that's kind of the key. Um, and you know we can then use the quick check tool to to use random input data and that turns out to be very very effective okay so the second aspect of this project is the wiley programming language this language has been developed at victoria university of wellington in new zealand um, it's been used for teaching introductory formal methods at a number of different places and it's also been used by now for quite a large number of research projects the language has been in active development since about 2010 um, and work is ongoing um, to improve the language and to improve its um, verification capability. And so here's a little excerpt um, illustrating the specification of a max function. Simply returns the maximum um, of two integer parameters, x and y. And the specification consists of two ensures clause that together form the post condition of the function. And so from the perspective of this paper, that the fact that we have pre and post conditions um, as first class aspects of the language well, these are incredibly helpful for automated testing because they provide a very natural test oracle that we can use straight away. We don't need to add user-defined properties. They are already naturally there. Right, so we're just going to go through the process of trying to verify a simple function, which is computing the maximum value of an array of integers. So here's my function here, and it's returning a value r given an array of integers items. And for now, we'll just leave it without a specification and we'll just go on and actually write the function. So let's have a maximum. I'm just gonna start off with zero. Like so let's use a function from the standard library. Like so. Okay, uh, I need to import that function, so like so. And there we have a very simple function, um, which sort of computes the maximum of an array of integers. Let's firstly check it compiles. Okay, it compiles. So now what we want to do is we're going to run the quick check functionality. I'm just going to turn that on by selecting check, and let's see what happens. And at this stage, everything seems fine. What we need to do is add a bit more of specification. So let's uh, write something a little bit more interesting. Um, let's start with something, something simple, uh, like the value that we return has got to be one of the items in the original array. Um, I can use a method contains from the standard library for this, which um, basically is checking um, that R is contained in the items with the range zero up to the length of items. So let's just import that from uh, my standard library, like so. And that looks pretty good. Maybe add a little bit of a description. Um, items return item returned must have been in items. Great. So now let's try checking that. And so now we're running through a whole load of inputs 
and we can see what the quick check tool is doing. Um, and it's immediately found a post condition violation. Uh, and we can see that it's basically saying if we pass in the max of an empty array or we pass in an empty array to max, then it's not satisfying the post condition. And we know that because um, M is zero in that case, uh, but M uh, zero is not contained in an empty array. Um, so it's kind of pretty clear. A maximum over an array of integers doesn't make sense um, in the context of an empty array. So we're just going to prohibit that. Easiest way to do it requires size of items is greater than zero. Um, bit of a description. Uh, cannot get max for empty array. All right. So let's try that again. All right, and this time we've got another post condition violation. And we can see that it's saying, okay, if we pass in the max uh, with an array containing just minus three, then um, it's not, the post condition is not satisfied. So what's going on? Ah, well, we've started with M being assigned to zero. And so, you know, all the items in our array were below zero, hence we had a problem. Okay, so what should we do? We should just take out the first item. Uh, and we can uh, even optimize that a little. And that's great. At that point, we've now uh, automatically tested our code using the quick check functionality, um, and it's passed a whole bunch of tests. And as we could see during the process, we've we've gone through and actually fixed a few problems that we that we kind of found. Okay, so here we see our, our max function um, partially implemented as we had it before. What the quick check tool wants to do is to generate automatically input values to run through this function and check it does the right thing. And so we're going to enumerate input values starting from the smallest. Uh, and in this, for this example, uh, we'll use integer ranges from uh, 0 to 1 and we'll allow arrays to uh, range from length 0 up to length 2. And it's fairly straightforward. We're just going to start generating all these input values. So we'll start with the empty array. Then we'd have an array of size one with zero, an array of size one with one, an array of size two, let's say with zero, zero to start with, and so on. And so what the quick check tool is gonna do, it's gonna pass those input values into the precondition of the function, uh, and it's gonna exclude any that don't meet the precondition of the function. So in this case, the only one that doesn't meet it would be the empty array. So that one will be excluded and the rest of them will be passed into the function and we'll check that the function actually does the right thing uh, and we'll check that the post condition for whatever value is returned is actually met. And that's it, easy. Okay, we've had a little look now at how the quick check for Wiley tool works. And what I wanna do now is actually take a look at some uh, important questions like how expensive is the tool actually to run uh, and how effective is it at finding bugs um, on more realistic programs. So the main benchmark suite that we used for our experiments uh, was the Ybench benchmark suite, which is a collection of short programs written in Wiley. Um, there are 31 programs in total, um, and you can see here, I haven't got space to show all of them, unfortunately, but that's most of them there. Um, and you can see if you look at the lines on the code on the right-hand side, that they're all pretty small programs. But if we look at the descriptions, well, they're all doing stuff that we would recognize, stuff that we would consider to be useful in some sense. So an important aspect of the Quick Check for Wiley tool is the configuration parameters that we use when we run the tool. And we can set these on the command line. So as we're going through a checking session, um, if it's taking a long time, we might want to reduce the search space. Or if we haven't found anything and we want to get better confidence, we might increase the search space, um, even though that takes perhaps a bit longer. And so in order to get a feel for how that affects the tool's behavior, I've defined five sort of artificial um, scopes, which range from the, the smallest, so tiny, the tiny scope being the, the very smallest, but also the presumably quickest to run, uh, through to the, the huge scope, which is the, the largest in terms of the search space, but presumably would take the longest to run. So if we look now, um, for example, at the small space, uh, we can see that integers are always in the range minus one to one. So that means we'll, we can generate any integer like minus one, zero, and one, but those are the only ones that we're going to consider. Likewise, we, if we look at arrays, then arrays are either the empty array or one, so or a length one. So, you know, we could have the empty array, 
uh, we could have, let's say, uh, minus one, we could have zero, and we could have one for our arrays. Um, if we look at the depth, so this is the depth of recursive um, structures, linked data structures. Uh, and so here the depth can either be zero or one. And so if the, um, if the link structure uses a null terminator, then a depth of zero would be just the null terminator, like so. Um, or we could have a structure of depth one. And so if that was a linked list, for example, then that would allow us to have um, one link effectively followed by the null terminator. Now the other two ones are perhaps a little bit less obvious and I haven't really talked about them that much so far. Um, but basically the alias width tells us how, how many aliases we can have for an object. Uh, so in the small scope, we can either have no aliases. That means that you know either every object maps to a unique object or every reference maps to a unique object. Right, there are no, there's no aliasing at all. Um, or we could have an alias width of one, which means we can have at most um, two references pointing to the same object. So each object can have at most two aliases. Um, and the rotation, um, which is the last sort of configuration parameter, this is to do with how we manage uh, lambdas. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it here because it's a bit strange to explain. Um, but if you look in the paper, you can find more details. Okay, so here we have the performance data. Um, where we've measured the execution time in seconds for each of our benchmarks across the different scopes and sampling rates that we've considered. Um, it's quite a lot of information here, so I'll just kind of work through and explain uh, what it means. Um, generally speaking, on the left-hand side, we have the smaller scope, and on the right-hand side, we have the larger scope. Um, and so what we sort of expect to see is a kind of degradation in performance from left to right. So if we look at the sort benchmark as one example, sort of provides quite a useful example. Um, there's a bunch of stuff we can see here. Um, firstly, what we can see is that the two smallest scopes, which uh, are the tiny scope and the small scope with a sampling rate of 1.0, um, they're not really registering. Um, they just executed very quickly, right? And then we've got the medium scope at a, range, at a sampling rate of 0.1 and a sampling rate of 1.0. Um, and those didn't take very long either. But then as we move here into the large scope, um, which is up here with a sampling rate of 0 0.01, 0 0.1 and 1.0, it's basically this three right here. We can see that um, actually it's starting to take a bit more time. It's taking like 20 seconds at that point. Um, and finally, we can see that the uh, huge scope is taking longer again. Okay, so now we're looking at the precision data um, across our benchmarks. So to generate this data, we, we had to create a set of benchmarks which had problems in them, um, or at least were likely to have problems in them. Uh, so to do this, what we did is we took the benchmarks, um, the benchmark suite that we had, and for each benchmark, we applied a bunch of mutations to it. And so these mutations were relatively simple, things like replacing equals with not equals, uh, less than with greater than or equal, um, replacing logical or with logical and, and so on. And so we went through each benchmark, well, the tool, uh, sort of mutant generation tool, went through each benchmark and identified points where we could apply the mutations. And for each point, we applied the mutation and generated a mutant. And then we then enumerated all the possible different muta uh, mutants that we could generate. And in the end, we were left with about um, 180, uh, sorry, 1,800 mutants um, which we, we managed to generate. So then we wanted to run the tool on these mutants and identify how many of them it actually correctly spotted as having a mistake. So if we look at the data, um, again, we've got the smallest scopes on the left-hand side and the, the largest scopes, which are presumably the most precise scopes on the right-hand side. Uh, and there are a few pretty obvious things that we can see. Um, the first thing is that um, the small, the tiny scope and the small scope generally perform quite badly. Um, so if we look at them, sort so for sort, for example, um, code jam, uh, if we go down here to the binary heap, we can see tiny in particular doing quite badly. And the small scope is doing worse than the others, though in that case, not so badly. Um, there are a few anomalies here. So the strongly connected components example uh, is an anomaly where the small scope actually uh, provides the best. Uh, and the reason for this uh, is to do with timeouts. So effectively, we removed um, uh, benchmarks that timed out. Um, and so what that meant, it had a kind of uh, sort of skewing effect 
Um, so if uh, at a given scope we had a lot of timeouts, then that brought the overall precision down. And so what you can see here, uh, for example, is that the medium scope um, is performing worse uh, than the small scope. And so the key question is, well, what are the takeaways from this? And actually what you can see is if we look at a lot of the benchmarks, in fact, the, um, the precision across the scopes that we've looked at is actually pretty consistent. Once we get past the tiny and possibly the small scope, at that point, it doesn't seem to make any difference or not a lot of difference. Right, that's all we've got time for, folks. If you enjoyed the talk, then maybe check out the paper.